Hi, I'm Old Norse Specialist Dr. Jackson Crawford. Today, I'm going to be talking about a subject that's been fairly often requested, which is about cussing. And so I will discuss the broader phenomenon of cussing and swearing and the various related things and languages around the world in some kind of general terms at first, and then getting into the specifics of what some of the equivalent sort of phrases, at least in tone, are in Old Norse. In a lot of ways, I don't think this is exactly what people expect, but I will warn you at the onset that though I am not a big cusser personally, and when I am, I tend more toward the kind of damn hell side of the spectrum, I will by nature be saying some words here that may offend you for one reason or another. They may not just be cuss words, but also other things that I point to as equivalents for causing offense in one culture or another. It is not my intention to cause anybody offense, but because people will moan about it, um, you know, if I don't say something, let me just go ahead and warn you that there is some blue language ahead. All right, so cussing as a phenomenon. I think there's kind of a titillated sense that a lot of people have that there are certain magic words we can all say in any given language, you just have to know that set of words, that really set our betters hair on fire, that really make them drop the Earl Grey cups they're holding with their pinkies out and make their powdered wigs fall off, and they just snort in shock when we say them, and we, we, we let them know that we don't give up, right? But that really isn't necessarily the case in any language that there's just this magic set of words, right? In English, it's kind of this classic set of the F word and the C word, and you know, then you can kind of move down the scale to some other words. But in any given language, the power that certain words are given to offend has to do with a really broad constellation of cultural uh, uh, cultural practices and cultural effects that get tangled up and that change generation to generation, right? If the F word is shocking in certain contexts to some people today, it's because our parents and our grandparents inculcated in us this sense that this is a shocking thing to say, right? That this is something that you don't say in every context. But consider how fast that can actually change. In 2020, are you shocked when a nine-year-old tells you to go F yourself? Um, I have to say I'm not. I probably was the first time, <laughs> but I lived in LA and then in, in the Bay Area long enough while working at universities in those areas that uh, I heard kids cuss a lot and eventually the shock factor kind of wore off, right? It's, it's only shocking if it actually maintains a certain amount of, of rareness, right? And nowadays, if somebody says, you know, F you, it's as likely to be a joke as it is to be serious, right? I mean, depending on the tone of voice, if someone is saying, you know, ha, 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 man, F you, right, substituting the actual word for the F there, um, you know, that's not threatening. That's not disgusting. You're not going to have a fight with this person or never speak with that person again. But if somebody is on, you know, somebody's in your face wagging a, a, a fist in your face saying, you buddy and and adding maybe some threats and some other harsh language that's threatening not necessarily because of the presence of that f word but because of the tone and because of the actual threat that's involved right so these cuss words or we might call them more generally shock words change over time quite a bit and in our society the cuss words or shock words that used to shock people are really losing a lot of their effect um I mean, but they also gained that effect over time too, right? So for instance, fuck, the F word in English, is from a very ancient Indo-European root, as ancient as many other words in, in English, if you go by its, how old its roots are in the, in the oldest reconstructable ancestor language, but on European. It actually comes from a root that is shared by words like fist and five. It's actually an old root for fist, right? So, uh, 
fuck comes from an older word that has a more general sense of striking. It comes from striking in a sexual coital sense, right? But it's ultimately related to to fist, to five, and to Latin uh, uh, pugnus, meaning fist, uh, Greek pugne, meaning fist. It became shocking in English in an earlier modern age that regarded sex as something shocking to talk about in public, right? Something that ought to be kept out of public view. Now, the, this word really has lost a lot of its, its, its power in English, not only because uh, so many people say it, right? We're exposed to an unlimited amount of media um, for an unlimited amount of time each day. Um, you know, 80s, 90s TV and movies really overplayed the shock factor of these words so that kids growing up in those decades, including me, uh, lost some of our awe for them and then subsequent generations seem completely to lack any awe for them. Uh, probably in English, the one word from that earlier age uh, where, you know, these really explicit sexual words uh, became taboo that has survived this taboo is the C word. But even then, it's not necessarily that it's an explicit reference to sex that makes it taboo anymore. The thing that has preserved that as a really bad taboo word is more that it's a way of belittling women, which is the actual taboo now, right? Today, people talk very openly about sex in ways that, uh, you know, for someone raised in a pretty, I don't know what the term is exactly, uh, somewhat prudish way, <laughs> you know, even 30, 40 years ago, uh, sometimes kind of shocking. Um, but that's, but in, in the broader culture, you know, you can turn on network TV during prime time and see very explicit depictions of and talk about sex, but not very explicit depictions of and talk about belittling women. And that's why the C word has remained um, shocking and taboo. But other old taboos that we had, like not talking about um, the parts of the body related to sexual reproduction, right? Um, or related to uh, fecal matter. Uh, those words have mostly not not gone on to be particularly shocking anymore, right? People say, holy shit, or, you know, they call somebody a dick or something like that. And it's not, it's not something that you necessarily even rush to cover a kid's ears about anymore. I don't know. Uh, and then, of course, another old taboo that has really lost a lot of taboo significance in English is uh, religious taboos. And this is probably the one that was earliest leaking away. You know, in the 19th century, uh, damn you, could still be really fighting words. Uh, go to hell, of course, uh, that's not a big deal cuss word anymore. Um, but in the Middle Ages, you know, my word, that's one of the worst possible things you could say to someone is go to a place of eternal torment that we all believe in, right? that we all believe is sort of inevitable unless you believe just the right things. That's, that's a truly shocking thing that doesn't really start to become so, so entirely pithed of, of shock till, you know, late 19th, early 20th century, a sort of secularizing society uh, with so many different denominations and beliefs that these things kind of lose their, their shock value because they don't really know what people believe. And, uh, you know, I, I think American society secularized in several successive waves, and one of the first ones really was kind of pithing the idea of, of heaven and hell of, of really strong mainstream cultural value. And so my grandparents and stuff like go to hell and damn you without a whole lot of uh, concern about the mixed company around them. Okay, so in the Middle Ages, in early modern times, people lived in a world where where religious cussing was probably the worst thing, right? Calling, saying, damn you, God damn you, go to hell. It's probably the worst thing, kind of thing you do. In 19th century, you get a strong emphasis on um, fecal matter being really bad, right? We're, we're clean, we're, we're kind of pure. Um, you know, we don't want to talk about, we don't want to hear words like shit, piss, right? And then we've always had, until the last several decades, a pretty strong taboo against open talk about sex making things like the F word, um, and then references to, to body parts uh, involved in sexual acts, uh, fairly taboo. All these things are kind of leaking away, but that doesn't mean that English is losing taboos, right? It's a mistake to say that uh, just because we don't have the same taboos that people in America or England had in the late 19th century, that we don't have taboos at all, right? 
nowadays probably the worst taboos uh, linguistically are race related, right? So you're not going to say words of uh, disparaging character about somebody's race without causing serious grievous offense, right? But and on the same, uh, and, and, and actually it's kind of the same taboo, calling somebody racist is also a really huge, um, shocking, um, um, you know, offensive, um, anger producing thing, thing to do, especially if it's not true. Um, and of course, I guess people disagree about what, what that word even means, but that actually has to do a lot with its strong taboo cultural associations now. So taboos change, but the language never really loses taboos. So what you can call cuss words are then going to defer a lot, generation to generation, culture to culture, and you're not always going to have a word that's just shocking or supposedly shocking in the same way that, say, English fuck is. Right? Think about the various ways that word is used. You know, ha ha ha, there's YouTube videos that are 20 years old about this now, but people say, you know, holy fuck, what the fuck, um, that's fucking awful, right, etc. None of which really has anything to do with the basic meaning of the word as, as a vulgar way of describing the sex act. Just the word itself is regarded as kind of offensive, scary, and shocking. But, you know, there's not a word in Old Norse that you can use in the same way as you can use English fuck, right? <laughs> what fuck or whatever is not not really there now in the modern scandinavian languages you do have kind of an equivalent in uh, fan right and its various regional uh, equivalents which is actually the old word for the devil so in in modern scandinavian languages early modern scandinavian languages you saw a lot of religious cussing and some of the worst stuff you can say today kind of the equivalent to the english f word is the norwegian f word fan right the devil uh fan tale, uh may the devil take you is a, a really bad thing almost equivalent to saying like f you um, but that's contextual. Even the kind of spread of fan as this sort of all-purpose offensive word probably has nothing to do with the influence of English fuck. Uh, and there's just not something you can insert into any place where you can insert the English F word in Old Norse and still have, cause like shock and offense. But let us take a look, with all of that being said, at what did cause shock and offense what were some taboo things to say in Old Norse. And of course, as always, this has the caveat that I can't possibly list every single possibility or context, but uh, I can lead you pretty far down this dim, dark road. After, just a quick word from my long-suffering sponsor. Okay, so we talked about how later medieval, earlier modern, English and to some extent Scandinavian-speaking people had taboos about, uh, about some religious ideas, like hell and dam, about fecal matter and uh, uh, <laughs> the refuse of the body, and about explicit talk about sexual acts and body parts involved in sexual acts. What, though, was actually shocking to the pre-Christian Norse to the extent that we can infer that? Well, there were some taboos against blasphemy, although blasphemy seems not to have been quite as taboo as in later Christian culture. There were still penalties for it. We read in uh, Islandinga Bok, one of the really early works of Old Norse literature about early settlers in Iceland and their history, about a certain man named Hjalti who was convicted of blasphemy, which required a huge fine on pain of being banished for just this little couplet. Vilk egi god guya, grey thikir mer froya. Very shocking. He says, I don't want barking gods. I think froyas occur. Some people translate uh, bikya, or not, it's not even bikya, uh, grey in that line as bitch. I think that's actually fairly wrong to emphasize it as a female dog, since it's a neuter term. It's more about dogs being sort of low than about them being female. Uh, actually, you can see some stuff about that in the commentary of the Wander Solve Them All, because this word comes up there. Anyway, he calls the goddess Freya a dog. Actually, he calls all the gods dogs, because he says they bark. Gia. All right, so that's worth a blasphemy charge and uh, a fine and potential banishment. So there is some fear of blasphemy. Um, 
on the other hand, fecal and other excretory taboos, your shit and piss words, uh, don't seem to be as big of a deal in Old Norse culture. There doesn't seem to be much offense there. Uh, in fact, the words are basically the same. These are old Germanic words that go back to the same roots. In Old Norse, you pissa and skita, uh, which are related to the English words, and those are used in such normal everyday context that I doubt it would have been shocking to hear a kid say them. They were the normal words. Actually, there's a lot of words for piss in Old Norse. Uh, another one is miga, which is what you'll often see in uh, in the Eddas. So, for example, swa er sagt at han meig er han so thor. It is said that he, is talking about Mokrakolvi, the enormous thing that helps Rungnir in his battle with Thor, that he uh, pissed when he saw Thor. Uh, or even in the poem Lokasena, where Loki says the Njordr, Humis moyar hovdu thik at hlan trogi ok ther i mun migu. Himir daughters uh, had you as a urinal, and they pissed in your mouth. Uh, this is, notice in the Poetic Edda, it's in a collection of uh, old and largely fairly formal poetry. Uh, it's a shocking accusation, but the word itself doesn't seem to be uh, uh, taboo as such. And to this day, in, in modern Norwegian, at least in my experience, you can say shit and piss, but you're actually from Old Norse, shita, skita, and, and pisa, not English, although people can mistake them as such. Uh, you can say those things fairly, fairly casually, and even in, in, fairly, in pretty mixed company. Now, sexual insults are pretty taboo in Old Norse, but for different reasons, I think, than they classically were in English-speaking society. It's not so much a taboo on the discussion of sex per se, it's more a taboo of accusing people of things that are inappropriate for uh, their sex in terms of sexual activity. So in particular, accusing a woman of being, uh, I guess the equivalent in English would be like nymphomaniac, right? Lustful, something like that. Uh, or accusing a man of being lustful for a man. Basically, it's, it's actually the same word that's used in either case. You call it's arger or rager. You see the A and the R switch. It's called metathesis. It's pretty common in Old Norse words. Um, that same word can be used to insult both a man or a woman. Used of a man, you're calling him homosexual. Used of a woman, you're calling her lustful. Either way, you're saying they lust for sex with a man, but it's a different reason why that's insulting for each one. Now, that's a hugely insulting thing to say in Old Norse. Uh, we actually do see it in that same poem, Lokasena, after... Uh, uh, or no, actually, before Loki tells Njordr that the daughters of Humir pissed in his mouth, uh, Njordr says to Loki, uh, uh, where'd I put this? Hitter under er os rager er her in of common, ok hever so born of borit. It is a wonder, a surprise, that a rager, right, homosexual god, has come here and has born children, of course. Loki has actually had children as a woman, um, and he is being uh, uh, roasted about this, and, and Locus into the poem where all the gods get insulted about one thing or another. And so this word is actually such a bad insult that in the oldest Icelandic law code that survives, remember it is Grogos or Grey Goose, uh, in uh, one section there's three words that provide a penalty of full outlawry if you say them about somebody. One of those is Arger or Rager, uh, which we've already discussed, and another is Throden or Sorthen. So it lists Arger, Strothen, and Sorthen. That's why it says three words. Although Arger has another form, and the Strothen and Sorthen are ultimately from the same root. And they mean, you know, a man who's been used sexually by another man. I, I don't know. You can come up with all kinds of ways of translating that. I'm, I, you leave that to your imagination. Um, at any rate, the insult is, again, based on a man engaging in uh, sexual acts that are regarded as inappropriate for his sex, not necessarily uh, taboo about sex per se in all cases. Um, we see these words in a bloodshed all the time. Um, another section of, of Grogos, the Gregor's Law Code, actually calls, uh, calls these words uh, among the Ordthat er mother er victum, a word it is legal to kill a man for. And it, and, I, and it really does result in bloodshed all the time. Uh, in uh, Ref Saga, which I've done a summary of on this channel, uh, our hero Rever uh, slaughters the father and sons just over the insult that he is a rever in ragi, rev, rev the, the homosexual. Now a king can get away with this kind of shocking insult a little bit more readily than most of us. There's really nobody to to punish a king except a king, so kings 
pretty flagrantly uh, call people whatever they want to. There's a pretty famous scene in the saga of Oliver Tryggvason, king of Norway, where he says to a captain who's uh, trying to keep a ship off of the, uh, the front of the line to protect the king, because the king is on the ship, he actually draws a bow, holds the arrow point to his face, and he says, uh, I didn't know that I had a captain both red and gay. Uh, I guess the guy has red hair, and so that's why he goes for the alliteration Raudan Ok Raga. But here's kind of a, a particularly old Norse thing. It's apparently all the worse when these insults are embedded in poetry. I guess the idea is that poetry is kind of the, the mass media of its day, right? I mean, uh, the, the position of the Norse poet or skald is roughly equivalent to the position of, you know, a famous recording artist today. Uh, their music travels around, people remember the lyrics, they recite them, so you're kind of introducing something into the cultural flow. And people get bored, they want to hear the latest burn somebody's put on somebody else, so it travels pretty fast. But it's also probably pretty bad because it shows that you put some real effort into insulting somebody. And that's probably true today, right? If I just say eat shit to you kind of curtly, kind of in private, even if I'm serious, it's probably not as big of a deal as if I say it in a perfect sonnet. You've never learned, Old Norse, your PhD, as fraudulent as when a stranger throws a shadow at a dog to make it flee. You are that dog, more oft than you suppose. I won't read you the uh, uh, whole sonnet, but <laughs> there was a time. Um, and of course, Old Norse poetry is fairly famous for, or Old Norse poets are fairly famous for these sort of uh, roast contests, right, these insult battles that they have. Sometimes people translate this as flighting. I don't know why people translate an obscure Old Norse cultural practice with an obscure Scottish word for it, but uh, that's what you sometimes find it called. Um, you, you get these backs and, back and forth uh, in poetry, especially in sagas of poets, in the saga of uh, Bjorn, the champion of the people of Hitterdal, which I haven't summarized in the video yet, and in the saga of uh, Gunnlaugr uh, Wormtongue, which I have summarized in the video already. Um, you have two skillful skalds or, or Norse court poets who just go after each other in poetry with the weirdest, worst, sometimes really horrible insults. And sometimes just off the wall, like, <laughs> you know, uh, your dad is a fish that your mom ate. Like, just strange stuff like that. But because it's poet, poetic, it's, it's memorable. And of course, even the gods engage in this. Um, in the poem Lokasena, where Loki insults all the gods and they insult him back, um, it's all in poetry, right? In fact, it's all in, uh, in, in, in Ljodahotar, the same meter as, as most of Halvamal is in. So it's not informal in a way, even though they're going back and forth with what sound a lot like people maybe having a, a rap battle today. At the very beginning of Lokasena, when Loki's trying to come back into the hall, uh, one of the, uh, I guess, waitstaff, you could say, confronts him at the door and says, Vetstu, erthu in genger agis haler i, o thatsum tatsio, ropi ok rogi erthu uis o hol regen, o ther munathau therrathat. And Loki replies, Vetstu that eldir, evit einir skullum sor irdum sakask, eudir verda mun eki ansvorum, erthu malir til mart. So what this means is Elder says, you know, if you go into Agus Hall to see that feast, if you cast slander and lies upon the loyal gods, they will wipe it right off on you. And Loki replies, you know, Eldir, if you and I alone exchange insulting words, I would be quite, basically, I would win, I would, be, I would benefit in the contest if you said too much. Right, it's an insult about your insults. And then he goes on to insult all the gods and goddesses. I mean, most of the goddesses he just calls whores. And then the gods, he has a whole rich panoply of insults for, mostly about cowardice, um, or about how he slept with their wives and, and, and all kinds of various different things. And of course, he gets made fun of for having been a woman and having had children, and he makes fun of Odin for some of the same stuff. It's, a, it's an elaborate poem that perhaps, um, if I thought more than three people would watch, I would do one of those deep dives in an Old Norse, but those videos don't get much reception. Anyway, it's noticeable that in Lokasena, with the gods insulting each other, 
that they all try to keep each other from saying these things, right? There's this like desperate tone you, you get where they'll say, Loki, don't say anything more. <laughs> right, Loki, don't say anything about me. At the very end, Siv, Thor's wife, comes up to Loki and is really trying hard to get him not to say anything about her alone, right? She brings him something to drink, says, hey, Loki, you know, you're a great guy. Ha ha, don't say anything about me. But of course he does. And he says, yeah, well, I slept with you. Uh, <laughs> I'll never pay Thor for it. There's this, this way, to bring this back to the beginning, where in all languages, we try to give words more power than they have, right? I can't actually hurt you by saying, you know, fuck you, or your arger, or saying in, uh, in the memorable words of one brother to another at the beginning of Grimness Mall, Thardu Tharer Smil Havithik, go where the trolls take you, which kind of reminds me of modern Norwegian Fan Tade. But I can hate you so much or be so angry at you and yet have really no power over you that I decide that cussing at you or making a YouTube comment about you or a Twitter at about you or a nasty post in some forum about you somewhere, I can kind of try to pretend to myself that, that makes a difference. And I think that, that cussing is a reflection of the same phenomenon. We feel so strongly about something that we are trying to, that we can't really do anything about, that we're trying to kind of channel it into these words and evoke our culture's worst taboos. In our case, um, traditionally those were things like hell, fecal matter, and explicit talk about sex. For the Norse, those were things like uh, homosexuality, uh, lustfulness in women, um, a little bit of blasphemy, uh, <laughs> a little bit about trolls taking you, maybe. Um, but we evoke these taboos, these things that our culture is afraid of or, or hates, and try to kind of summon them in this false and, and sometimes a little bit pathetic belief that if you speak of the devil, he'll appear, and maybe he'll take care of that guy you don't like. And maybe sometimes it's comforting, Maybe sometimes it makes us feel like we're really telling the man where to shove it. But uh, I think different cultures all kind of come to the same frustrated attempt to influence the world by just speaking. And it doesn't really work, but we keep trying it again and again and again. And we just cycle new shocking words in when the old ones don't shock anymore. And yet they never call lightning down from the sky. All right, well... I hope that was at least what some of you were looking for in this topic. Um, I hope that if you enjoy this video that you'll look at some of my other videos. I have many hundreds about Norse language, myth, sagas, and a lot of other things about language more generally. I also have books. Most recently I've translated Hovamal together with the Old Norse original text side by side with a commentary, and that is called The Wanderer's Hovamal. And there you can read more about what I think about the word groi, an insulting word for dog that I translate ker, and other people insist on translating bitch. Oh well. That word also doesn't always mean the same thing to people. Some, it's always funny to me, just as a side note, when you read some really formal translator who uses that word, it just, it means such a different thing now than I think it meant in 1820. That <laughs> It's just very strange to read. All right, well folks, for now, I'm from beautiful Colorado, I'm wishing you um, no curses upon your heads. And by the way, you know that these are called curse words because originally they actually were considered to be curses, right? Go to hell was actually considered to be kind of having magical effects that might actually curse you. We'll talk about that in another video, probably about uh, ideas about magic, maybe with uh, a guest like my friend, Dr. Luke Gordon, who teaches about this stuff in New Mexico. All right, anyway, folks, from beautiful Colorado, let me wish you all the best. Now let me make a quick PSA here. Um, I know many people are, and, and I'm flattered that many people are interested in coming to the University of Colorado to study with me or, or take my classes. But remember, as discussed in several videos, I am leaving the Nordic program at the end of spring 2020. So I will no longer be teaching classes like Norse mythology, Icelandic sagas at CU. If those classes continue to be taught at CU, they'll be taught by somebody else. I will no longer have any association with the Nordic program. I will still be at the University of Colorado in an unpaid position as resident scholar. And hopefully uh, during this period, I'll have more time to uh, make these videos, which of course reach more people than any classroom ever will, um, work on my upcoming translations such as the Prozetta and work on my class in Norse mythology for the great courses. 
but please don't come here thinking um, that that I run some some Hogwarts for Old Norse. I, that I, I don't, and you're not going to find that anywhere, actually. There really aren't any good jobs teaching this stuff, and I need to try to make a living. Um, and actually, given the lack of rewards in teaching this stuff in a conventional way in classrooms, I, I need to take the time away from the classroom to work on these projects that really reach the people that are interested in this stuff, the videos, the books, and now great courses. All right. Well, as always, for beautiful Colorado, let me wish you all the best and uh, good health and the best to you and yours during this uh, whole coronavirus situation in April 2020. All the best.